DNA decay. Some of you may have read about bacteria that were found as spores in insects trapped in amber. And um, the spores turned out to be viable. They're 25 to 40 million years old, according to the conventional way of dating things. Some of you may have remembered that we talked about in this class 250 million year old bacteria in a salt crystal which again are spore forming organisms that um, made it that far. Well, how far back can you go with DNA? How long does DNA last? And uh, that's the question we'll be exploring. And uh, the answer I think will be interesting and possibly revealing. Uh, in, in Nature News, in the there's an article called uh, the DNA has a 521 year old year half life. Um, I think as you will see, that's a wild exaggeration in terms of accuracy. But um, uh, there's the uh, website, and it is indeed in Nature, probably the most prestigious um, uh, scientific journal. Um, and it starts out by saying, few researchers have given credence to claims that samples of dinosaur DNA have survived to the present day, but no one knew just how long it would take for genetic material to fall apart. Now, a study of fossils found in New Zealand is laying the matter to rest and putting an end to hopes of cloning a Tyrannosaurus rex. So Jurassic Park is now officially dead, at least according to Nature News. After cell death, enzymes start to break down the bonds between the nucleotides that form the backbone of DNA. Microorganisms speed the decay with similar enzymes, I might add. In the long run, however, reactions with water are thought to be responsible for most bond degradation. Groundwater is almost ubiquitous, so DNA in buried bone samples should, in theory, degrade at a set rate. Determining that rate has been difficult because it is rare to find large sets of DNA containing fossils with which to make meaningful comparisons. To make matters worse, variable environmental conditions such as temperature, degree of microbial attack, and oxygenation alter the speed of the decay process. But paleogeneticists led by Morton Allentoft at the University of Copenhagen and Michael Bunce at Murdoch University in Perth, Australia, examined 158 DNA-containing leg bones belonging to three species of extinct giant birds called moa. And if you're wondering what that critter is on the right-hand side of the screen, that's a, one of the largest moas. They're rather impressive birds. The bones, which were between 600 and 8,000 years old, had been recovered from three sites within five kilometers of each other, with nearly identical preservation conditions, including a temperature of 13.1 degrees centigrade. The findings are published in today in Proceedings of the Royal Society B. diminishing returns. By comparing the specimen's ages and degree of DNA degradation, the researchers calculated that DNA has a half-life of 521 years. That means that after 521 years, half the bonds between nucleotides in the backbone of a sample would have broken. After another 521 years, half of the remaining bonds would have gone, and so on. The team predicts that even in a bone at an ideal preservation temperature of minus 5 degrees centigrade, Effectively, every bond would be destroyed after a maximum of 6.8 million years. The DNA would cease to be readable much earlier, perhaps after roughly 1.5 million years, when the remaining strands would be too short to give meaningful information. This, quoting, uh, this concern confirms a widely held suspicion that claims of DNA from dinosaurs and ancient insects trapped in amber are incorrect said Simon Ho, a computational evolutionary biologist at the University of Sydney in Australia. However, although 6.8 million years is nowhere near the age of a dinosaur bone, which would be at least 65 million years old, we might be able to break the record for the oldest authentic DNA sequence 
which currently stands at about half a million years, says Hall. The calculations in the latest study were quite straightforward, but many questions remain. I'm interested, very interested to see if these findings can be reproduced in very different environments such as permafrost and caves, said Michael Knapp, a paleogeneticist at the University of uh, Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. Um, moreover, the research has found that age differences accounted for only 38.6% of the variation in DNA degradation between mobile samples. Other factors that impact on DNA preservation are clearly at work, said Bunce. Storage following excavation, soil chemistry, and even the time of year when the animal died are all likely contributing factors that we'll need looking into. Well, so what is that article? Well, you, it's actually available online. The Half-Life of DNA in Bone, Measuring de Decay Kinetics in 158 Dated Fossils. And um, there's the website. And uh, it's uh, published in 2012 in December, so it's not that old. It's less than two years old. Um, <coughs> And there's the abstract. Notice again, it's looking specifically at claims of extreme survival of DNA. And they've emphasized the need for reliable models of DNA degradation through time by analyzing mitochondrial DNA from 158 radiocarbon dated bones of the extinct New Zealand MOA. We confirm empirically a long hypothesized exponential decay relationship. The average DNA half-life within this geographically constrained fossil assemblage was estimated to be 521 years for a 242 uh, base pair mitochondrial DNA sequence corresponding to a per nucleotide fragmentation rate of 5.50 times 10 to the minus 6 per year. With an effective burial temperature of 13.1 degrees centigrade, the rate is almost 400 times slower then predicted from published kinetic data of in vitro DNA depurination at pH 5. So they're saying it lasts a lot longer than the laboratory thought it did, partly because the pH is uh, not typical bone pH. Although best described by an exponential model, um, considerable sample-to-sample -sample variance in DNA preservation could not be accounted for by geologic age. We're going to see some of that data in just a little bit. This variation likely derives from differences in taphonomy and bone diagenesis, and it could also be due to temperature variations as well, which have confounded previous less spatially constrained attempts to study DNA decay kinetics. Everybody else's data is a mess. Ours is a little bit of a mess, but it's better than usual. Lastly, by calculating DNA fragmentation rates on Illuma high sequence data, we show that nuclear DNA has degraded at least twice as fast as mitochondrial DNA. Or to put it that way, uh, the other way, mitochondrial DNA lasts longer than uh, nuclear DNA. These results provide a baseline for predicting long-term DNA survival in bone. Actually, I think they have done some good work, although, as you will see, there are limitations to the work they've done. Although early 1990s claims of DNA recovered from million-year-old fossils, references one to four, and we'll see those references at the end, are now widely regarded as modern contaminants. In other words, don't believe everything you read in the published literature. Hmm. Um, and how do you know what to believe? That's an interesting question. Uh, the kinetics of long-term post-mortem DNA decay is still poorly understood. There's a lack of empirical data on which to estimate the rates of, rate of insight to DNA fragmentation. Because the field of ancient DNA has recently entered the era of whole genome profiling, which is dependent on samples of exceptional preservation, understanding the nature and rate of DNA decay is as pertinent as ever for both predictive and authentication purposes. 
I'm skipping through some of these uh, paragraphs here. This is not a straight reading, otherwise we'd be here for an hour or so. Despite many attempts, it has proved extremely difficult to demonstrate a ge general association between age and DNA preservation, probably because of variation in physical, chemical, and biological factors such as taphonomy. That's <coughs> Greek word for uh, taphos is grave, so it's burial uh, conditions. Fossil storage, oxygenation, microbial diagenesis, pH and ionic strength, and the presence of cations, humics, and humates. Moreover, most studies are limited by small sample size and lack of individually dated specimens, leading to potential problems of mixed taphonomies. The absence of clear temporal trends in previous work suggests that the rate of DNA decay either fluctuates widely, hence not at a rate per se, or that it takes a large homogeneous and accurately dated sample to overcome the noise introduced by the aforementioned factors. In the light of many inconclusive results, a common refrain is that DNA re decay rates cannot be predicted. And they're going to say, oh yes, they can. We're doing it. Establishing an association between age and preservation is not the only challenge. The rate of depurination, that's the DNA, as you may remember, comes in with four bases attached, two of which are called purines, adenine and guanine, and the other two of which are called pyrimidines, uh, uridine and, uh, pardon me, not uridine, thymine and, cyt and cytosine. And the um, adenine and guanine apparently can pop off of the DNA, and when they do, the DNA is much easier to break up at that point. And that's what depurination has to do with. The rate of depurination is influenced by temperature, among other factors, which is not surprising if you know biochemistry. You kind of expect that. Which explains why the most extreme survival of DNA was documented in approximately 450 to 800,000 year ice cores. Smith et al. argued for the possibility of using the temperature dependence of DNA fragmentation to normalize the samples and predict DNA survival. Such a relationship has been demonstrated for collagen, the most abundant protein in bone. However, to establish a thermal age model for DNA, the first step is to confirm that long-term in situ DNA degradation can be described by a rate kinetic. By the way, um, can anybody remember another um, process that's supposed to take place by a uh, similar rate kinetic that's supposed to have a half-life? What? Protein, you turn. Protein degradation, oh yes. One more. Amino acid racemization. Oh, yeah. And uh, you remember the, uh, those of you who've looked at it anyway may remember the uh, mess that that uh, that data is in. Uh, these are the places where they found their DNA. This is New Zealand, uh, or at least one of the islands. I've forgotten which one. And uh, is that the northern island? That's the southern island. Yeah. And um, and um, if you zoom in on this, and then you zoom in on that, and these are the three places where they got. Uh, uh, DNA. Ross Lee is the one that has the oldest moa bones. Um, yeah, some of the bones are uh, 602 years before present, which is 19, uh, 1950 by convention. The present is now the past, but um, that always happens. Uh, 1950 minus 602 would be 19. It uh, would be uh, uh, 1348. So the last Mo is supposed to have died 
actually during uh, the Middle Ages. There's your data. I will grant that it looks like there is a s decrease in general. And, um, but I don't think that you'd really want to date any specific uh, bow bone by its um, DNA. Um, I am intrigued that the report is that it's 521 years it seems to me that that's too many significant figures. <coughs> and you'll notice that it does depend on the burial site a little bit. The regression here is, is uh, um, seems to be steeper than the regression here, with the regression here being in the middle. Now, um, those are interesting enough. Um, we have a comment here. Just, Just a minute. Oldest bone. Go ahead. I'm curious as to why the oldest bone uh, is estimated six to eight thousand years old. They have DNA. It's uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of years old. Apparently, it does have some DNA. Well, you will notice that the relative copy number is. Uh, 0 0.00002 000 000 probably. So it's very low. Um, uh, another thing is I did a little bit of looking around and I got at least one quote, maybe a couple. I uh, can't remember a uh, well-known scientist. And he's, he was saying that um, of course, it's carbon-14 in these bones, which is a radioisotope. But most of the chemicals in the molecules, uh, DNA molecules, are not radioisotopes. Well, that, that's true, um, but the bones do have enough carbon in them to do a carbon-14 date. As so we have found out there's actually enough carbon in dinosaur bones to do a carbon-14 date the carbon-14 dates that they get are not uh, ones that uh, uniformitarians particularly appreciate. Um, well, let's, let's uh, do just a little bit more playing with these, with these numbers here because from a creationist standpoint, uh, one can show that at about um, 612 BC more or less, the carbon-14 calibration curve is probably off and is dating things too old. So all of these dates need to be moved towards the present. And by all of these, I include the little one out here. Um, now, these other dates that are out further probably need to be moved further in, for a Masoretic date at least. And this 8,000 year probably needs to be moved quite a bit in. Um, the relative copy number would remain the same. That would steepen your curve just a little bit. Um, although it raises questions as maybe this one uh, was there during a warmer period of time as well, in which case, of course, uh, its position as the lowest one uh, might not be uh, an appropriate one, uh, or m might be appropriate for now, but not not for a uniform decay rate. Um, but be that as it may. Um, they're going to compare their results with Lindahl and Ny Nyberg's results, which were experimental in the laboratory. And what they'll tell you is the rate constant depends on absolute temperature according to the relationship 3.2 where A is the pre-exponential factor, EA is the activation energy, and R is the gas constant. On the basis of the Arrhenius plot in Lindahl and Nyberg, 
showing the temperature dependency of depurination at pH 5, we estimated K to be uh, 2.11 times 10 to the minus 3. I should have put that up. I think it's in the, the text as, a, as, a, uh, as an exponent per site per year. And uh, which is 384 times faster than the rate estimated from the MO data. In other words, the MO data suggests that it's that it's longer actually. And here's the figure four that they referred to. Uh, the green is the predicted at pH five. The red is the predicted at pH 7.5 and this is their number with various other uh, uh, data points in between. And uh, this is bond survival. Just simply are they stuck together at all. And, th and this is 242 base pair survival. It's kind of uh, how many chunks of that size do we have? And you'll notice that um, the average DNA, uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA half-life is uh, 521 years, but that's way too accurate. Um, th this is way more precise than, than the data they actually have. Assuming that long-term DNA fragmentation happens primarily as a result of depurination, this discrepancy is probably related to pH and access to free water. Even if the burial environment is slightly acidic, sacrificial dissolution of microcrystal and carbonated bioappetite will likely act as a buffer within the bone. What they're saying is that if there's a little bit of acid, the bone will dissolve slightly and return the pH to something closer to 7.5. On the basis of the measurements in Berna et al., we use pH 7.5 as an appropriate value for bone. From Lindahl and Nyberg, we find that K at a pH of 7.5 is about 73 times slower than the same at pH 5. And uh, you saw the drawing of uh, what you'd expect. Um, but still, five times faster than the rate observed for MOA uh, mitochondrial DNA. Given that the same authors also reported a twofold rate decrease in the presence of appetite, that is, appetite actually stabilizes DNA, as in bone, the rate expected from Lindahl and Nyberg's in vitro results is perhaps only roughly twice as fast as the rate we observed for MOA. Uh, QPCR estimate. Now remember, this is the estimate um, for mitochondria, and the and the DNA actually matches pretty well if you're talking about regular DNA. And they have this table, which has the temperature variation, and you'll notice it's rather extreme. At uh, for 30 base pairs together. At 25 degrees centigrade, the half-life is 500 years. At 15 degrees, it's 3,000 years. At 5 degrees, it's 20,000 years. And at minus 5 degrees, that is to say frozen, and a little below freezing, it's, it climbs up to 158,000 years. So that uh, something that's been kept freezing for, let's say, 4,000, 6,000 years, it would be possible to get DNA out of. Um, which raises some very interesting questions. Uh, you'll notice that even at five, minus five degrees centigrade, at six million years, the DNA should be totally uh, destroyed. The average length should be one base pair. That means basically it's completely uh, torn up. And you will notice that um, that for practical uh, purposes, uh, 9,500 is uh, 
when you're going to break up 500 base pair, even at freezing. And at 100 base pairs, you're going to get 47,000 years freezing, and you've broken over half of it up. Variance in DNA preservation. Only 38.6% of the variation in DNA preservation could be explained by the age of the fossils. You saw that slide. Despite efforts to minimize variation, see figure two, part of this variance can be ascribed to P uh, qPCR stochasticity. That's a fancy word for random uh, variations in decay. Or at least not variations unrelated to um, time in particular. It is tempting to suggest that we can now predict the temporal limits of DNA survival. We're getting too near the end of the, the, the uh, article. And finally, refute the claims of authentic DNA from Cretaceans and Miocene specimens. You see, we can, we can, it's tempting to suggest we can just limit this and all those guys that are getting DNA they can't possibly be getting DNA out of dinosaur bones. This is, however, not straightforward. One needs information on the number of template molecules in living tissues and estimates of post-mortem de DNA decay rates for each tissue type. However, the half-life predictions display the extreme improbability that an authentic 174 base pair long mitochondrial DNA fragment from an 80 to 85 million year old bone could have been amplified, so forget about it. Our results indicate that short fragments of DNA could be present for a very long time. At minus five degrees centigrade, the model predicts a half-life of 158,000 years for a 30 base pair model, uh, 30 base pair mitochondrial DNA fragment in bone. Even rough estimates such as this imply that sequenceable bone DNA fragments may still be present more than one million years after deposition in deep frozen environments. It therefore seems reasonable to suggest that future research may identify authentic DNA that is significantly older than the current record of approximately 450 to 800 kilo years from Greenlandic ice cores. So we should be able to get quite a ways back, but nowhere near what you need to to get Jurassic Park. Now those Re those four references that said we've sequenced very old DNA are uh, Woodward, Wayland, Bunnell, uh, DNA sequence from Cretaceous period bone fragments. I want you to notice something. That paper got into science. Presumably it was peer reviewed. They found Cretaceous period bone fragment uh, with DNA in them. Golenberg et al. Chloroplast DNA sequence from a Miocene magnolia species. Miocene being uh, what, 30 million years? 25? And chloroplasts, of course, are a little bit like uh, mitochondria in that there's a lot of them per cell and they all have basically the same DNA so um, it means that uh, there's a lot of copies that, that one of which could have survived. But see they're saying you can't do that. Um, this all at all again in science DNA sequences from a fossil termite in oligomyosine, amber, and their phylogenetic implications. Oligomyosine, 10, oh, wait a minute, you're, you're right, I'm, uh, oligocene. Yeah, the stuff that I've seen is, uh, eocene is 40, but maybe, yeah. 30 maybe, somewhere in there. 
Um, amplification and sequencing of DNA from a 120 to 135 million year old weevil. Nature. These were not done in the uh, Journal of Irreproducible Results. It appears they're there. The article says they just can't be. They've got to be contamination. So what do you do about the above data? Well, maybe they're both right. Maybe there is data there that's real, but DNA can't last millions of years. You put those two together and what does it suggest? It kind of suggests maybe that uh, the material they're dealing with isn't millions of years old, right? It's interesting to hypothesize now. Let's suppose we have Eocene material in permafrost, which actually exists in Canada. Permafrost, of course, staying frozen all year round. That's why it's called permafrost. Now, in a creationist model, it's very interesting to note that you have, let's say, the flood buries all this stuff. It lasts for maybe 100 years at normal temperature. I don't know, maybe 50. It depends on the, the difference between the flood and when the ice age started. Um, but, you know, a relatively short number of time. And then for the last 4,000 years, more or less, maybe a little over, at 5 degrees centigrade below zero. Frozen. That should be within reach. Right? You should be able to get DNA out of it. Now, if you take an evolutionary model, you have 36 million years at normal temperature, um, whatever ambient is, but presumably somewhere around 15 degrees centigrade, at which time everything should have long gone. And then you have 4 million years at minus 5 degrees centigrade, which that's basically the ice ages, with maybe a thaw in between now and then. There's no way that DNA should have survived. This presents an interesting test. Now what you guys may not know is that somebody's actually testing this right now. And uh, I don't think I'm at liberty to say exactly what all is being done, but um, I will just say that preliminary results seem to indicate the DNA can be recovered. <laughs> Now the question I'll leave you with is if they find that it's pretty consistent and that it matches the organism that they're working with, could you get this published? And I'll leave you that as my question and then invite your comments and of course your questions as well. Yes. Uh, I just got a uh, Axe and Axe. Axe and Axe. Uh, That's magazine. From, yeah. from ICR. Right. Yeah. And they uh, brought up a new problem, you might say, for evolutionists. Um, they were saying that they're finding that uh, radioisotopic uh, rates can vary from anywhere from 10,000 times to 1 billion, depending on uh, environmental factors. They didn't get into a lot of it, but one they did mention was uh, 10,000 times for, uh, I'm not sure if it's theorem 238 or what they call it, uh, at 10,000 times. 
uh, under high pressure waves, which you were assuming you had during the flood. So um, there's apparently another angle coming in. And that's not going to help them. The evolution is in I'm sure. I'd be very interested in reading, reading the evidence for that particular one. It's this monk's uh, this paper. Month's? Yeah, this monk's. Um, I'll try to remember to bring it in. Uh, I haven't seen that particular one for radiometric dating, but uh, yeah. uh, I, I'm not sure that we've gotten that far. Uh, I do know that there are some atoms that can be made not to be radioactive simply by stripping off all the electrons. And you can convert it from a finite to a basically infinitely improbable that it has radioactivity. But that's a rather extreme thing, and that obviously doesn't have to do with pressure. Yeah. Well, I think what it suggests is uh, we don't know very much and there's probably a lot of things out there that uh, going to eventually change some of these concepts. What, uh, what I'm interested now in uh, regarding this is what we do with the, uh, with the DNA data. And I'm interested, uh, you know, if, if the DNA is only 4,000 years old, then you have the possibility of being able to sequence some of it. Um, the other thing that would be interesting to find out is if there are dinosaur beds in either Canada or Siberia. Do you know? Dinosaur beds in Canada and Siberia? Yeah. yeah. You find dinosaurs over the world. I'm sure you can find some. Uh, probably there you got some dinosaurs in Antarctica. <coughs> Because if you have if you have dinosaur beds in either Siberia, Antarctica, or Canada, where there's permafrost, then it would seem that one could simply, uh, uh, you know, do a little PCR and probably re recover some of that. Again, remember the time frame, maybe 50 to 100 years, maybe <coughs> of 150 years. I I don't know what the exact time frame would be at relatively ambient temperature and then deep freeze for the last uh, 4,000, 5,000, whatever it is, years. You should be able to get uh, DNA out of it. But wh what do you call getting DNA out of it? Uh, how many, how many uh, bases are you going to eliminate to say it's no longer DNA? Uh, that's a problem. And of course, the, uh, the other problem is that cytosine deaminates and becomes uridine. Uh, so if you do this kind of thing, basically what you have to do is you have to sequence both sides and then wherever you find adenine, yeah, you can assume that the uridine is on the other side. If you find guanine, you can assume, I think, cytosine is on the other side. And you probably need to have something that's sensitive enough to tell the difference between enosine, which is an adenine deamination, adenine deamination product. and um, and guanine. Structurally, structurally, they're far enough apart, but most of our DNA sequencing hasn't been, um, shall we say, sensitive enough to be able to tell that particular difference. Do we need to uh, stay by this? minus five degrees centigrade uh, restriction. You mean could you find something that was just in a very cool place in general? Yeah. Possible, although I would think that freezing and thawing cycles would probably tend to mechanically disrupt uh, DNA somewhat. To me, the, uh, y of course, if you steepen the curve, if you adjust your carbon-14 dates, for the older ones. That's right. You're going to steepen your curve. And uh, this will shorten shorten the time even more. I, 
I think they must be dealing with contamination. Now, this is, of course, a, a serious problem there. Of course, you know, DNA is everywhere. Uh, I mean, these later papers you mentioned, you know, I, I, that's the best explanation I can give for it in, in terms of the first paper. And, uh, well, there's one other thing to keep in mind, and that is that bacteria have been recovered with DNA intact enough to actually function as, as the information storage template for a bacterium. Uh, in both the um, salt crystals in the Permian and in uh, amber. So it's not just a matter of, you know, DNA fragments that can be amplified by PCR. They're actually DNA fragments that are sufficiently, uh, have sufficient information on them to, f to function as DNA. Uh, and that, that raises some very interesting <coughs> questions. But you see, from a creation standpoint, that's easy. Yeah. Uh, of course they're there. It's just that uh, the time frame is off, and so therefore they've only had 4,000 years to decay, and spores can last that long. Comment of I see, uh, seems to me, a problem with some of those. Uh, if I could take the same DNA, is this coming through? I could take the same DNA, and this is purely speculative for you, and put it under different conditions to preserve it. Let's say this uh, creature lived 50 years, maybe 1,000 years ago, but I put the DNA under certain circumstances. Maybe it has not much to do at all with age. It just simply means there's different ways of preserving it. It may disappear very quickly in one condition and last much longer on the other and we're interpreting the age. Pass the mic back to Dennis there. Well, Paul, with uh, half-life so short, it seems to me that there should be some interest in looking at DNA in younger uh, bones, uh, where we have a better understanding of uh, the dates of origin. It would still be several half-lives. Uh, native burial grounds, some of the ancient um, uh, recovered, um, fossilized, uh, what we believe to be humans. Is there any interest in, in, interest in studying those bones? Um. I think there's some interest. Um, I think one of the things that people are trying to be very careful about is that uh, at one point somebody did T-Rex and it turned out that, uh, that, the, uh, that the sequence was identical to Turkey. And at that point people are starting to ask, um, has anybody been eating a turkey sandwich before they did the testing? And I think that's an important qualification. Uh, I think that if we get DNA that is significantly different from modern material, then you probably can trust it a little more because at that point, modern contamination really can't account for it all. Um, that's one of the reasons for, uh, why if we were doing this kind of thing, um, for example, um, if we found that uh, ancient spruce had the exact same chloroplasts as modern pine, you begin to wonder. On the other hand, if they are distinct from each other, that the native DNA that's you know around in the area is not um, what you're getting out of this permafrost stuff, then I think you can make a case that it really is there. They. The question that I have is, isn't, isn't it going to get ugly if you start finding this stuff, finding it reproducible, and then try to publish it? From a creationist standpoint, is it sure? From a 
evolutionist standpoint, that one's going to be fought tooth and nail. I predict that if something like that were to happen, you'd probably get another disappearing paper. Uh, well, I just want to, it, it just depends on the, the editor you happen to run into. Uh, how much prejudice there is and so on, and uh, there's a chance you could get it published if you have done a good piece of work and you don't draw any creation conclusions. If you draw creation conclusions, I think it's out. So you think that if somebody were to just do it and say, hey, looky what we found, and, uh, and say, and we checked to see, and there's nothing like it here, and there's nothing like it here, and there's nothing like it here, and uh, we made sure that we didn't have any pine boards around. I mean, this study got published. Uh, you do the same thing, and it probably it might. It just depends on what they think of you. That's that's true. It depends on how it's presented. Although, I think for some things it's so obviously directly challenging that uh, it won't get in. But the other thing is, I think that we should always, if we're going to do this kind of thing, we should try. And we should try as carefully as we can so that we can say, and here's the paper that was rejected. And here's the reasons they gave. And just lay it all out in the open. Well, it, it's, it's nice to know that the accuracy of science determined that T-Rex is really a big turkey, but uh, that aside, um, how, how costly is this, and where is most of this testing done? In universities, I'm assuming, but... Um, it's not all that costly. Uh, most of it has to do with uh, fantastically finicky t technique. Because, for example, if you're doing mitochondria, you have to be careful or, you know, you'll uh, knock a little flake of your skin into it and suddenly now you're getting human mitochondrial d DNA instead of uh, MOA or, or whatever. So you essentially, you have to have a real clean environment and you're dealing with such small objects to uh, but yeah. it's, it's not something that somebody could do with the uh, chemistry set at home I assume no but probably not <laughs> certainly not without huge amount of training yeah. uh, PCR is a specialized field anyway uh, how close are we to uh, like getting DNA these uh, I mean is is part of the goal to get some of this I mean, I'm sure the the poultry people would love to get some DNA from that guy, but maybe. But uh, uh, how how close are we to really? I, I don't think that guy will do well in a farm. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, a little bit bigger. You probably know, like break break uh, like a mini probably break version. too many fences. You know? <laughs> he might eat his owner, I think. But as far as you know, how close are we to actually, or is anyone actually trying to do this to get DNA and and then recreate the the, d the creature. So. You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, what about doing uh, the MOA? Because obviously 600 years ago is still within the, you know, where you should be able to get significant pieces of uh, DNA and you probably could c reconstruct a MOA if you could figure out how to get the DNA into the egg and take the uh, old DNA out. I think some zoos would be really interested to get one of those guys. Well, maybe not Jurassic Park, but like prehistoric park, maybe. A follow-up to the previous comments. Um, does Loma Linda University have the equipment and the ability to do sequencing of the type that you're talking about, ancient DNA? I am told that they are preparing to do some of that stuff, and one of the reasons they're going to be doing it is to protect endangered species. Um, I think that, that some of it's going to be for medical research as well. 
And as I understand it, the main part of it is actually in the School of Medicine. But I'm sure that that uh, collegial cooperativity could be arranged. Do you know of any other creationist institutions that have the capacity to do what you're envisioning now? I don't, although I will have to confess that I'm a little ignorant in that particular regard. I do know that some work is being done at Southern. Now, whether they're doing it themselves or whether they're farming it out is um, a question that I can't answer. I suspect that they don't have their in-house lab and that they're actually you know, preparing specimens and then sending them off to, to the actual sequencing at you know, sequencing houses, which do it quite cheaply, as I understand. Of course, it'd be much cheaper once you have all the equipment and you have it set up, much cheaper to do your own. And I would think many institutions would be uh, looking in that direction. You know, it's just an observation. It's an interesting question. What would happen if Loma Linda University were to actually set up their own setting and they were to do let's say Eocene Wood, and find a, let's say a spruce, uh, DNA from a spruce that <coughs> they were able to relate to modern spruces, and it was like 99.5% identical, but not 100%, so that you could show that it didn't come from uh, modern spruce. Um, and uh, and you started drawing conclusions as to, you know, this pseudogene, it didn't used to be there, it used to be an actual gene. It would be very interesting. Um, could you get that kind of stuff published? I would think so. Um, would... Uh, Why not? Let, let's supposing that you publish that stuff and then somebody came and argued that there's only been 5,000 years of evolution because, uh, because there's only that much difference between this and modern spruces. Uh, now, now what would the journal article want to retract at that point? Could you publish any more? Because you know creationists are going to look at this and say, see, look, it's only been 5,000 years. 4.5, 5.5, whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, I sh another uh, point while I have the mic, <laughs> and we'll hear Dr. Roth. Um, question or the comment was raised about Antarctica having frozen dinosaurs. Let's remember, according to plate tectonics, that Antarctica was not always in its present position. In fact, it was closer to the equator than it was to the pole, um, if you accept plate tectonics theories. So it's probably not too likely you would find frozen dinosaurs, even even in Alaska. Um, maybe others will want to comment on that. Uh, well, getting back to your publishing article thing, <clears throat> I think you could get it published. I suspect that at least some scientists will immediately label this as this came from a creationist, forget about it. Uh, the sequence is probably more difficult to uh, justify what you've done than the article itself because the prejudice can be quite strong, as we've seen in so many cases, you know, people losing their employment because they were believed in creation. Uh, so you get the article published, it's okay, but the critiques that will come afterwards will tend to uh, deprecate it to the point that people say, well, we can't pay attention to that. Uh, and go on and wait for another article. That's why I almost wonder whether you're not better off farming this particular kind of research off into a standard commercial lab 
because, you know, we handed it to them and this is what they gave us. Uh, you know, you're going to complain about uh, whatever the lab is. Kind of like uh, getting, uh, getting your uh, radiocarbon dates done on an in-house lab versus, uh, uh, versus having it done at, say, Geochron or, or, or University of Georgia or something like that. I think it's worth trying, and the equipment is fairly simple for, for sequencing. Uh, uh, some I, small I have another uh, question, comment and question. Um, a lot of what we're talking about here depends on what our Earth history model is. Right. That, that's our starting point. And we do have a different model than the conventional model. We're not happy with radiometric dating, for example. Um, but even within the short age creationist model, uh, there's quite a bit of difference. And you mentioned 4,000 years. Some, some would suggest that we need at least 10 or 20,000 years to fit everything within a short chronology. Right. So wouldn't this be a way of using fossil DNA to test the various different, models? Different creationist models. Yeah. You're we should be right. looking at our own cells and testing ideas out there. And if they're valid tests, we could differentiate a good model from a less than good model. It's just an idea. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And uh, well, one of the things to keep in mind is that, that as far as I can tell, the best creationist model for plate tectonics is, is the, the one of Baumgartner. And that is rapid movement during the flood, slowing way down afterwards so that Antarctica, within 50 to 100 years after the flood, would have reached its present position. Maybe within one year, I don't know. But it should be, it should be fairly rapid. And so you have 50 to 100 years before the snow starts to pile up and the thing gets cold enough to be permafrost. Uh, if you listen to some creationists like Don Patton, uh, their theory is that ice got dumped on the poles and, and basically you had flash freezing. Um, I think Ord would dispute that. But in any case, 50 to 100 years is peanuts on the time scale we're talking about. Once it gets into permafrost, we're now into the minus five degree territory and it's entirely possible to get DNA. So digging up bones from Antarctica or from Northern Canada or from uh, Alaska or, or uh, Siberia is a perfect way, it seems to me, of trying to see if there's DNA in the bones. And remember, the scientific community was completely oblivious to the idea that there could be anything in those bones anyway. And then they started finding things like red blood cells and osteocytes and, uh, you know, and they fought it tooth and nail all the way. You know, and one of the reasons that, that Mary Schweitzer is so sensitive about the subject is because she's you know, I'm sure she's being told by many people that she's a closet creationist. Can I comment on just what you had said about uh, permafrost? Let's keep in mind that permafrost, at least in the Arctic and Alaska and Canada and so on, permafrost is actually taking soil and then freezing quite a bit of moisture in the soil. It right. can have peat, it can have plant material and so on. And so what you have is different in Antarctica because you have dinosaur bones in hard rock and the rock is highly mineralized. So you have to have a process of mineralization first before you could have freezing. And are you going to get mineralization in 50 to 100 years? That's something that creationists have not tested. We've well, other than with maybe Stalagmites, sometimes we find something covered. Yeah, but keep in mind that in Montana, 
they find the bones there. Yeah, and they're indurated. They're in sediment that's indurated. That's in sediment that's indurated. Highly, highly mineralized. All could, of it. Could we Mary find... Mary Schweitzer's is highly right. mineralized. But apparently that hasn't stopped the bones from retaining uh, organic material. In fact, it's a good way of sealing the organic material. It's like putting wax on a canning jar and sealing it up. So the more mineral and the faster you can do it, that's good. But what I'm saying is we haven't tested yet the rates of mineralization in a good scientific way. That, that's what I was referring to earlier. Um, Ken and I were having a slight disagreement um, about uh, being able to create, for instance, a moa bird. Um, I said, I don't think you're going to uh, create anything. Life out of something that's dead. You know, you probably going to have to use uh, living cells to work with that. Um, it's kind of like a resurrection. It is kind of like a resurrection. And it may turn out not to be technically feasible. That's, yeah. uh, which is a fancy and, and way then, of saying we can't do it. And also about the Arctic and so forth. Uh, it's been estimated that there were probably about 6,000 elephants in the Arctic. And apparently the change happened very rapidly because some of them were actually chewing, chewing grass and it was still undigested in their stomach, which takes about four or five hours. So this was a fast, very quick event. And to get as many as, say we have six million elephants, how long would it take to get to that kind of uh, uh, population? I suggest maybe there's some time in there one thing, you, one thing that you might be interested in, uh, Michael Ord has written some stuff that you can get. And uh, I, I think that that would be worth our while to, uh, worth your while to look at because um, some of this is like the dancing bear. It's uh, not so much that it dances so well as it is that the bear dances at all. And uh, some of the some of the flash freezing stuff has been apparently exaggerated slightly. Um, at least that's Ord's opinion, and Ord's uh, an expert, and he's willing to accept fast freezing, but uh, just finds that the it's not quite all that it's cracked up to be. Um, it's probably worthwhile studying this kind of stuff. The main thing I want to say is I think that rather than just dogmatically saying uh, that this is the way it is, that one of the things right, we should be doing is going out into the field and finding out what it is. Um, I see this not so much as a way of proving as a wonderful opportunity for research that could be supportive of a short age. And I think I'll make this the last comment as it is now 11.30. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, uh, Warren left, but according to following in his lead, uh, seems to me if you want to make this work, it'd be important to have a lot of data. Uh, don't run out with the first little result and try and claim that uh, the rest of the world is wrong. Uh, creationists have done this too often. They've embarrassed themselves and uh, the Bible and everything else by doing this. Uh, but uh, if you want to get make an impact, I think you need a lot of data. I think so, and it's also helpful to have data that can be reproduced by anybody else. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And of course, that that should be it. That this thing is easy to do. It's not. Uh, it's 
not a tough thing, uh, the sequencing, and that, uh, it's done with a lot of laboratories right now, all over the all over the place. It's, uh, it's not all that expensive either. Uh, so that uh, I think this is feasible, and it, it's it's another door, you know, that uh, uh, needs to be looked at. Well, with that. Uh, um Happy Sabbath. Uh, we'll see those of you who are able and interested uh, next week on information theory and uh, the, the book that was almost banned.